Jana Williams is going to be sharing about her summer experience. She spent the summer in Cambodia serving God in Christian orphanages. She grew up in this church. She's uh, going to Seattle Pacific University, which in another week she'll be returning to for her senior year. And I'm just um, uh, so thankful to this church for praying for her, for supporting her, and encouraging her, because she's part of us. And we want to be uh, ministering to the whole world and reaching out to, to anyone and everyone everywhere. And so let's uh, thank her for sharing and for going to Cambodia. Kitchen! Kitchen! Kitchen. Oh. Oh. 
Uh, this trip would not have been possible, and uh, it meant the absolute world to me uh, to be able to go back and to see these kiddos again and spend time with them. Uh, so today's sermon uh, is entitled One Family, and I call it that because Cambodian Christians have a song uh, that they sing quite often uh, that says, Now can I pray, please, Yem Chikru Moi, which means, In Jesus Christ, we are one family. And being with you here today, my church family, and sharing with you about um, Cambodian Christians, uh, my family over there, I hope today feels like a little bit of a family reunion because uh, we're all in God's family and it's wonderful to see what is happening on the other side of the world. So uh, the story of this trip um, actually uh, goes back to uh, 2017, and it's a story that I think uh, kind of starts with a little bit of a miracle in my life. Uh, last year, 2017, in February, I uh, left Seattle Pacific University in the middle of the year and on a medical withdrawal, and I came back home, and it was a really, really difficult time in my life, really dark time. I was really struggling health-wise. I was battling severe depression and anxiety and panic disorder, and I was having trouble eating, and I lost a lot of weight, and it was a really, really difficult time, and there were many days when I couldn't even get out of bed, I couldn't even walk. Um, and I couldn't, couldn't eat anything, I couldn't sleep, and um, I just felt so down and sad, and there was like maybe two months where I don't think I smiled or laughed for an entire two months, which, which isn't me at all. And um, I didn't know if I, would, if I would ever get better, if I would ever make it out of that place. And uh, I remember being in the shower one day, and my hands were shaking like this because of my medication, and uh, I just put my hands out like this, and I said, you know, God, I know from my first trip to Cambodia that there's a calling on my life and that I have a passion for these kids. But right now, you know, I'm so weak and I'm so down, I can't do anything. That if, if this calling is really true, if it's really on my life, God, then it's going to have to be you. And you're going to have to do it. And everything I do in the future is going to have to come through you and your strength because I am so weak. And I didn't get better right away. But I think that was a really important moment in my life to teach me dependency on God. And that when we go into ministry, even though this summer I went in and I was healthy and everything, um, to wake up each, each morning and depend on God for the strength to get through the day and for his spirit to be in the classroom and for him to do the work. Because we are not strong enough for all that God wants to do, that we have to depend on him. Also during that time, uh, when I was really sick and I didn't know if I would get better, I was praying to God. And I, you know, I was asking God, like, will I ever make it out of this? And he said to me, the strongest I've ever heard God say to me, he said, Jana, your work is not yet done. And I took those words and I held on to them and they kept me hoping, kept me believing, because I knew, I knew that that was a promise, that I was going to be healed at some point and that I was going to be able to continue in the passion and the work that God had for me. And so going back this summer is, was like the fulfillment of part of that promise. Of like, your work is not yet done. I had more work to do. And so this was the dream come true and really, really a miracle that I feel that God brought me from last year uh, to this year. <laughs> so I heard in a message something that said, um, remember that God's delays are not the delays of inactivity, but of preparation. And for three and a half years, I really wanted to go back to Cambodia, but it kept getting delayed. Um, but I think that was a time when God was just preparing my heart. And also, I heard a speaker once say that in our deepest need, we learn an element of God's character that becomes most significant to me. And last year, I really learned uh, about God as healer. It took an entire year for that healing to, to come. But I learned who God is intimately as healer. And when I went to Cambodia this summer, I was able to talk to them about the healing God had done in my life. And I know that resonated with them because they've also experienced a lot of healing from God in their life. Uh, so this morning, uh, there's a Bible verse from Isaiah that I kind of want to focus on. And I'm going to read it for you now, and then we'll dive deeper in uh, throughout the message. But it's from Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 12. So it says, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free? and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will appear quickly. 
Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and luscious tops, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the new day. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repair of broken walls, restore of streets with dwellings. I love this, uh, this set of verses. And um, at the beginning it talks about um, a kind of fasting. And I think when we think of fasting, we usually think of not eating food. Uh, but fasting, uh, in a spiritual sense, can be um, anything we're giving up or sacrificing. Uh, so that we can uh, spend our time honoring God and kind of focusing on God and serving God in a time that we, uh, we realize our dependency upon God. And I love that this verse talks about uh, a certain kind of fasting, um, something that is pleasing and honoring to God is um, living our lives in service, um, uh, helping the oppressed be free and, and feeding the hungry. So the very first place I went to on my trip was uh, a Christian community school it was way out in a rural village, and uh, it was started by a Christian family there um, because they really wanted to transform their village. Um, the village that they're in and, and the villages around them um, have a lot of difficulties. They're kind of, there's a lot of conflict, and um, there's a lot of uh, addiction, and there's a lot of pain, and there's so much tragedy and fear, and all of those things hold so much power over the people there. And I heard story after story of, of such tragedy and these children growing up uh, in extreme poverty and, and, and starvation and, you know, their parents dying from all kinds of things. And uh, it seems like these kids kind of have no chance because even if there is a public school nearby, um, the school uh, does not offer good education. They really have no chance of graduating high school and no chance of going to university. So everything seems stacked against them. Uh, but this Christian community school wants, wants to change that and wants to give these kids a chance and they offer a safe place for kids to come and play volleyball and play soccer and they offer three English classes and a Khmer, which is Cambodian language, uh, class and computer classes and Bible studies and these kids can come there and they can get uh, some extra skills they need that give them a chance, a chance of finishing school, a chance of going to university and um, they also um, are introduced to, to the love of God and a greater hope. Uh, than what is in this world, and um, and they need role models, good, healthy role models, because not all of them have that at their home. And so uh, here's the classroom that's connected to the side of the church, and uh, it really brings me back to those first verses in verse six that say, "To loose the chains of justice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke." Uh, because in this village, I mean the government and their circumstances and being born, born into intense poverty, all of those things are like these guilt and these burdens and these injustices on their lives. And this school is acting to lose those chains and to, and to set these children free. Uh, the next place I went to was the Camp Bong Cham Children's Home. And I was so excited to go back here. This is one of the homes I was at before. I know these kids really, really well. So it was awesome to go back and see how much they've grown and to spend more time with them and interact with them. And also see they have some brand new buildings, um, which was something we were praying for before, and it's awesome to see God's provision. Uh, the pink one on top is the new girls building, and the blue one on the bottom is the new boys building. And they've planted a ton more flowers and plants, and it's just a beautiful area now, and it's so wonderful to see all of that. I was also able to see this little boy again. Um, this boy's name is Saban, and this is a picture from when I met him back in 2014. And uh, here's a picture of him now. He's all grown up. And um, he was actually at a different orphanage before and got transferred to this one. They thought it would be a better fit for him. So it's been, it's been several years. And to see him and to see how he's grown and matured and learned and to see the healing that has taken place in his life is, is pretty incredible. And he really looks up to the house parent as like a dad figure. And, um, Bandy, the house parent, gives him little chores and tasks to do to, to give him a purpose and really is training and leading him. And, and right now we're really praying um, for uh, to get a, a private tutor for him to come to the school uh, to teach him because of his learning disabilities. And there's not funding for that now, but I know God's going to provide. And, 
and I know his future is very bright. So it was beautiful and wonderful to see him. He has such a kind heart, and he talks about how much he loves Jesus, which is just, just, I mean, warmed my heart so much. Uh, after Camp Home Champ, I went to kids camp, and I know you saw a lot of videos and pictures of that. And kids camp is where um, all 15 children's homes, which are part of New Hope for Orphans, they all come from different parts of Cambodia to one place by the beach, and they have this camp for the kids, and they play games and do songs and small group time, and we played out in the ocean, and it was the best like three days of my life for me because um, I knew all of these kids, and to reconnect with all of them was just an absolute blast, and to see them having so much fun. And uh, I think the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my whole life is uh, 450 Cambodian orphan children in one room praising the Lord of Jesus. And I was just like, these kids are going to transform this nation. This is, this is the start of something. Or something then after kids camp, I uh, went back to Pray to Hear Children's Home. This is one I was at before as well, and it was amazing to see the transformation. Uh, here is the home back in 2014. Uh, the road was really bad. It was just a one-room building. Um, they had like just little like tarps and things for shade for outside for the kids. Their kitchen was kind of in a little shack, and the housewives actually slept outside under this tin roof, and you know, were getting bit by mosquitoes all the time. And they didn't have a lot of resources, um, but they prayed and prayed, and God uh, came through with a provision, and uh, they were able to build this whole brand new building, and uh, it's. Dorms on the top, boys on one side, girls on the other, and then on the bottom, the house parents have a room they stay in, and then there's also a big room for church services. And then next to that is this building, which is the learning center. You saw the pictures of the classroom, and uh, an office, and I also stayed in this building. And um, so just to see how that has grown and what God has done for them, and that through their faithfulness, um, God has really come through. And this is like the other eating area and a little kitchen. And um, some of the kids there were new. I didn't know them. They'd come since I'd been away. And uh, they were so full of joy and laughing and fun. And you saw them in the pictures. And the house parents uh, started telling me the stories of these kids. And uh, especially this one family of kids, they uh, had been abandoned in a village. And they had just been walking around, wandering around, starving. And the village chief finally found out about it, called the house parents. They went over there to get them. And the house parents told me that when they picked up these kids, they were just bones. They said the bones were just sticking out of them. And they're like four and six years old. And they had the really big bellies from starvation. And they brought them back to the home and they you know, fed them and brought them back to help. And nowadays, you would never be able to tell. You'd never be able to tell that those kids have been starving. And, uh, but now they're full of joy. They went from starving children to laughing children. And uh, it was such a joy to meet them and, and hear stories like that. And they now have the, the hope of Jesus. And they know how much they're loved by God. And they're going to be raised to know that love. Um, now, I tell, tell these stories, and they're so amazing and inspiring and beautiful. And, um, but there is another part to it that, that work like this is, is really difficult. That these children homes and the house parents and all that they do to care for these kids is, I mean, it's, it's monumental. And taking care of 30 kids who have all come from difficult backgrounds, have different issues and emotional issues and needs, and, and raising them up um, in a godly home is, is a really, really difficult task. And there's always something coming up and always a new need that needs to be filled, and they don't know where provision is going to come from, but they pray and they keep on in faith. And House One told me that this work is so hard that we wouldn't do this if we didn't love Jesus. But we love Jesus, and Jesus has called us to this work, and so we'll give everything. We'll give our whole lives. And man, they started crying just telling me about this, and then I was crying, and then just they're, they're heroes, they're absolute heroes. Um, and they also do ministry out to the villages around there, the house parents do, and uh, this is just some of the houses kind of out there. And so I was able to go with them out to this village, Kukuit Village, and we were able to uh, hold some services, and it's really exciting because this village has been pretty closed off to Jesus and the gospel, but they're just starting to open up, and um, Soli, the house parent, is super excited about this, and he asked our church to be praying for this village. Um, that, that this village, that the people would come to know Jesus and that the Holy Spirit would break out here and that it would, that it would transform this place. Uh, so I really ask you to be praying for this village. It's called Kumkuit Village. Um, here's a few more pictures of us uh, doing a little, little worship there. So this brings me back to these verses in Isaiah. Um, 
Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. He will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. And this is something that was so visible there uh, in Crib here. And I also want to point out the last lines here. Uh, it doesn't say, like, and if you ever maybe need help, then you can cry out, and God will be there. But it says, when you do this work, that when you're feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, and that when you're serving God and living out a calling, that it's going to be really hard at times, and you're going to cry out for help. You will cry out for help. And it's going to be difficult. But in those times, God is going to say, here I am, and his presence is, is going to be with you. Um, so when you follow God's calling to be loving, joyful, hopeful, generous, kind, and hospitable, you will quickly discover your tremendous insufficiency and your tremendous need of God. Uh, the last place I went to was the Camp Hong Tong Children's Home. This is the newest uh, New Hope for Orphans home, just started last year, and it's really exciting because the house dad, Sita, he actually grew up in New Hope for Orphans as an orphan. And now he uh, is married with a wife and a young son, and they are now the house parents of this home. And uh, they have this one little building right now where the kids stay, and then they have a church building, uh, which also functions as a classroom. And a uh, really beautiful home to see a um, house parent that came out of, out of that system. Um, when I was at these children's homes, one thing that um, I really learned was about creating a culture. And I'm not talking about American culture or Cambodian culture, but rather um, a culture of love, hope, faith, uh, generosity, hospitality, and joy. And that at these homes, um, their foundation is Christ, and they're pursuing God with all of their hearts. And they're very intentional about creating a culture of you know, love, joy, and hospitality. So that when you go there, you feel it. You walk in, and you immediately feel and know that culture. And that is something that I just want to encourage us today, that that's something that we can all do, that wherever we are, wherever we go, whatever environment we're in, in our homes and in our families and in our workplaces, that we can create this culture, that that can be our mission, that when people you know, come in the doors of our church, that they feel that culture, that it's like walking into one of these children's homes with the joy and the love and, and that flows from us, and that's how we're the light of the world, that Jesus is so important to us that the culture surrounding our life is, is all of those fruits of the Spirit. Amen. And uh, <laughs> when I go to Cambodia, I get so filled with the love and joy of these children. And wherever I go, whether it's here or back to school, I want to bring that with me. And I want that to be flowing out of me so that the culture I was surrounded by there, it lives within me, it's Christ within me, that whenever I go, that culture can spread for me. And I know that it can spread for you too, and that we can create spaces and places and environments for people can feel that when they enter in. Uh, there's a verse from John 10.10 10 that says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's that feeling that culture is, is abundant life. Now, you may ask, why would someone spend their time you know, going out into these villages in the rain and the heat and eating rice every day and having lice every day and eating scorpions and eating spiders for a snack? I was just telling someone this morning, we were on a 14-hour drive from kids' camp back to Grace here, and the house parents pulled over, like, do you want a snack? Like, we're pretty hungry. And I was like, yes, yeah, snack. And they were like, okay, and they got spiders. And so I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I was pretty used to it, so, you know, not bad, not bad. Um, you know, and then, like, sleeping on a tiled floor, and at times, you know, before bed, having to shake the bugs off your blanket for your bed, and then when you wake up, having to brush the bugs off you and shake them off like you did. And, uh, you know, walking through these villages for hours and loving people and facing diseases and coming against dark spiritual forces and, and facing rejection. Hey, why, you know, why would we do that? Why did we do that? Uh, it's because we love God. We love people. We know what Jesus has done in our lives. And we want to share that with others. And we want others to encounter God's love. And we want them to have abundant life. And that is what Jesus offers. And we want all that fear and that darkness to be cast out of their lives. We want them to experience that culture of love, and joy, and generosity. But we have to be willing to be the people that God uses to accomplish this. We have to be willing to be the people God uses. Uh, so I want to jump back to the last few verses here. Uh, it says, 
if you do away with the yoke of oppression and with the pointy finger and malicious talk, if you do away with that, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then God has many promises for us. It says, and your light will rise in the darkness. Your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land. He will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters never failed. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age old foundations. You will be called repair of broken walls, restore of streets with bones. Now, uh, to be honest, when I was in Cambodia, sometimes uh, I felt just really, really overwhelmed because there's so much brokenness and there's so much need that it just seems to be completely overwhelming and I sometimes feel like I'm called to a place way out of my depth that I'm in over my head and I'm 22 years old, I have no degrees or any accolades or anything, uh, but I'm there because I'm called. And it was a tremendous privilege to spend time with these kids and a responsibility and something that stays with me, that when I come home it's not something that leaves me. That when I go to bed at night, I'm sleeping in my nice soft bed. I'm thinking about the kids in Cambodia who are starving and sleeping in the dirt. And that it's a tremendous responsibility and calling, and it's something that's too great for me. And so that's, again, where I need to go back to that place of open hands in the shower, when I say, God, this is too much for me, that I need to depend on you, and you need to hold this and carry this for me. Because it's because it's huge. It's, it's huge. And I want to do so much more. I want to save all the children, and I want see all the country changed, but I'm one person I can't do it. And I have to put that into God's hand. So God said two things to me in Cambodia, and I think they balance each other out quite nicely. One said, Jana, take care of my children. That while you're here, and while you're with them, take care of my beautiful little children. And that, that was a calling and passion in me at that time. And the other thing God said to me when I was feeling overwhelmed, he said, Jana, you can let go. I'll hold this. That I'll hold this for you. You don't have to hold the weight of this. So I wrote in my journal something that kind of describes this. It says, What I carry in my heart is a gift from God, a love, and a responsibility. It's not always easy to carry, but I know this is what God made me to do. It comes with tears and loneliness, but also immense joy and awe striking beauty. I'm living in a place of restoration where God's love is healing the lives of children and where God's love is ready to break out in the villages and transform this nation. Uh, I, have a, I have a prayer I want to end with. Uh, it's a very famous prayer. It was written by a Civil War soldier um, that is kind of the lessons I'm learning in my life for the past few years. It says, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything that I had hoped for, almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. So the promises I have for you to hold on to this week from those verses in Isaiah is God's healing, righteousness, the glory of the Lord is your guard. He will be there with you. He will guide you, satisfaction, strength, and restoration. Uh, let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this church and the generosity they have shown and the love and the compassion they have shown on these uh, children. And I pray for New Hope for Orphans, and I pray for the nation of Cambodia. I pray your love continues to break out, and that you use these children to change this whole nation, and that you would lift people out of poverty, and lift them out of spiritual poverty, and out of emotional poverty, God, and that your kingdom would come. We pray your kingdom comes, God, and that we would be people that create that culture of love and hope and joy, because we're all in for you. We're all in to your calling, no matter what it costs, God. We pray that you would follow, we would follow you. 